So I'm now recording. I have opened up the Anaconda Navigator and I've launched Jupyter Notebook. And that brings me to a screen in my web browser that should show the contents of the user folder in uh, Windows or Mac OS. I'm not familiar with how it would look on Linux. But from our first session, we did have a Python playground folder where I'm kind of putting files. And in here, the basics file is the one from last week. So I'm going to create a new one, a new Python 3 notebook. And it's going to open up and start just like the other one did. Are, are people able to see this all right? This is a good size. If I start typing, I'm going to go ahead and increase the size just a little bit. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to do it bigger. Okay, are we good, Darren Lee? Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to just do a couple of things that are a bit of a review from the last session that we had. Um, I want to talk about the variables and the types and things like that. So, for example, we could create some variables like, let's go here, cats equals three. Oops. Got maybe miles equals 26.2. We've got uh, lyric equals I am the very model of a modern major general. And the last one is um, eight dinner equals true. So a couple of things that we're looking at here, I want us to see, remember the coat, the color that various things take. We see that a couple of them are green. There's one that's in dark green. We have some other stuff that's in red. And when I run this cell, we've got a number here and we, it automatically creates another cell here. So what I'm going to type here is a command, the print command, print, with open and close parentheses. Remember this tool, whenever you type something that is, has pairs, like a parentheses or a curly braces or square brackets or quotations, it does its best to try and give you the other one too. So I'm gonna put here, I'm gonna put cats, and then I'm gonna type print, open parentheses, and I'm gonna use the other command we talked about last time, which was the type command. And it too has parentheses, and I'm gonna type cats again. Now, when I run this cell, this first one takes cats the variable, which we've defined here, it's equal to three, and type tells us that cats is an integer. It's a whole number, positive or negative, including zero. Now, one of the things that I, I wanna do is I wanna kinda of go through all of these variables real quick and show you a neat function that is in Jupyter Notebook. And I believe I mentioned this before, but it's a good thing as a reminder. You can have multiple cursors. So I'm going to hit either the command or control key, command on Windows, control otherwise. And now I have two blinking cursors. And so if I start deleting and start typing, I can type in multiple locations. I can run this cell again. We see that this is, now has the value of 26.2. My apologies, my dogs are barking. I think uh, the mail's getting delivered. 26.2 is the value that's contained in the miles variable and the type is a float. So it's still a number, but it has a decimal afterward. If I want to, I can come down here and do the same thing as before using the control or command key to do multiple cursors. I'm gonna type lyric and run this. It prints out the contents of the variable lyric and it tells us that it's a string. Remember string is a bunch of characters. Strings are usually in single or double quotes. And in this case, we have a long string that's a sentence. A string could be as small as a single character or a single word. It can even be a number. Remember in the last session, we had a situation where um, one participant had put the number in quotes, and even though it was a number, because it was in quotes, it was still a string. The last variable type or data type we're gonna talk about here, again, 
is a Boolean. Here I have a variable to check and see whether or not I have eaten dinner. So ate dinner is true. And when I run this, we see that it has a true value and the class is a Boolean. You've probably heard the term Boolean when we talk about Boolean searches in the, for um, when we're doing searches for uh, uh, content in our library search box, we have the Boolean operators and an or and not. The other thing that we talked about last week, we talked about, uh, we talked about if statements and else statements. So if I come down here and I'm gonna type cats again, I'm gonna set it equal to three. I can also change the variable, it varies. So I'm gonna say that cats equals cats plus one, right? The spaces aren't um, absolutely necessary, I'm just putting them for ease of readability. And then I'm gonna say if cats is less than four, colon, when I hit enter, it automatically indents. I'm going to say print, I am comfortable with this number of cats. I'm going to have an else statement, colon, print, um, hold up, honey. So we have a variable with a value, we're taking that variable, which is an integer, we're adding one to it and reassigning it to that variable and we're evaluating it here. If this evaluates to true, then this happens. Otherwise, this happens. So if I run this right now, it evaluates the va value of the cats variable in that third line. I'm gonna put some line numbers here. So in line three, it evaluates the value in the variable, three, uh, variable cats. So one of the things I wanna show here is something called commenting. Commenting is so that you can write little notes to yourself. You can, uh, you can put information there because when you come back to the code in six to eight months, you wanna know what you were thinking. I'm going to comment this out by putting a pound sign or a hashtag in front. If I run this now, it's going to assign three to the variable cats. When it gets to here, cats is now less than four and this is going to run. So this comment line, even though it's still in our code, it doesn't execute like before. That comment prevents it from running. Do we see the difference? This allows us to, in a sense, toggle on and off segments if we need to. So not only are comments good for reminding you of your thought process at a particular point, it's good to test things as well. So we've talked about variables, we've talked about data types such as integers and floats, we've talked about if-then logic, we've talked about comments. Another thing that you can do in Jupyter Notebooks, I'm going to add a cell, this time I'm gonna add one above. So I can insert a cell above, but if you'll remember the shortcut for this is to hit A for above, and now I have a cell above it. This drop-down window indicates it as being code. But what I can also do is convert this to markdown, which markdown is a text um, annotation language that for the most part is fairly simple to use. And in here I can say in the next cell, I'm experimenting with conditionals, the if then else, and comments. Now when I run this cell, rather than running it as code, I have a comment here, well it's like a comment, but I have code where I can write information about maybe 
cells here because Jupyter notebooks are intended to be shared. So if you're working with multiple people, this is a way for you to include graphics, for example. You could um, include links. You can put H, like, uh, not HTML, but very similar to HTML. There's all sorts of wonderful things you can do with mark, Markdown. And also, what I'm going to do is when we're done with this class today, I'm going to give you this sheet, this notebook, so that you can um, download it and run it yourself and experiment with what I've typed. Okay. So the two new things we've talked about today, we've talked about comments. We've talked about adding markdown cells. We've talked about review material that we had from last week. But what we really haven't done yet is we haven't really gotten to the core of what programming is about. Programming really is about taking information in, processing it, and spitting it out. Now we've done that here. We've taken in information for a number of cats, certainly. But if you'll think about this in a sense here, we're only looking at what's in a single variable cats. And we're only dealing with that essentially once, right? We check for the variable in cats. We check to see if it's less than four. If it is, print one sentence. If it's not, print another one. What if we want to evaluate multiple pieces of information at the same time? Well, what we can do is we can implement something called a list. A list is just like it sounds. It's like a grocery list. It's a series of items put all together. Now, for example, what if I wanted to make a grocery list? I can do it just like this. I'm going to say, I'm going to create a variable. I'm going to call it, say, groceries. And I'm going to use the single equals sign to indicate assignment. I'm going to put whatever comes after this equal sign into the variable for groceries. To indicate that this is a list, I'm going to first put a square bracket. Now you'll remember, as we mentioned before, whenever we do things with pairs, it's going to do its best to try and put the other side of the pair and put the blinking cursor in the middle. This indicates that I'm going to start creating a list. So let's put some things on our grocery list. Um, I don't know, apples, uh, bananas, um, cheese, uh, maybe some non-food items, detergent, and eggs. Well, eggs are food items, but detergent is not. Well, shouldn't be food. I, I hear that people eat that. They shouldn't. Um, so what I have done here is I have, using these square brackets and commas, I have made a list of five strings. When I run this, I now have using my type command, a list. Now, lists are basically containers. Now, remember in the last session, I talked about a variable as kind of like a bucket where you put information into it. A list is a bucket of buckets. And what's nice about a list is we can do things to each element in a list. We can go get things out of lists in specific locations. We can change them around and things like that. One of the things that's a little difficult to understand about lists is that they are a holdover, or at least one aspect of them is a holdover from computer science in that they are zero indexed. And what do I mean by that? I'm gonna add another markdown cell here. Lists are zero indexed. So just to show you here, this is a markdown cell. I've typed some text in and I've put an asterisk around zero indexed. When I run this cell, it's now italicized. I can go back and edit it, put a double asterisk 
around it and it's bolded. What does zero indexed mean? Well, simply put, the first thing, the first element in a list is element zero. Watch. Oops, groceries. Now, I'm going to use the square braces here, but notice there's no equal sign here. I'm just using the square brackets immediately next to the variable groceries, and I'm going to type zero. When I run this, it's going to go into the groceries list and take the first element, which is at position zero. And that is the string apples, right? If I say groceries two, that is zero, one, two, that will be cheese. You may hear of times of things called an off by one error. And sometimes when you're writing code, you'll want to get the first item or the 10th item out of a list or something that's similar. And you'll say, go get item one or go get item 10. And if you do so, you'll be off by one because the first one is zero. If people were curious about why this is, I'd be happy to go into it, um, but it's not really necessary for what we're doing right now. The point is, is I just wanna make sure that when we start making these changes here, and there's a uh, couple of things we're gonna do later, we're knowing that the first one is zero is important. So groceries zero currently is apples, but what if you don't want to get apples? Maybe you have enough apples, maybe you want something else at the grocery store. You can change elements inside of lists by referring to them specifically. If I do this here, groceries zero, and use the single equal sign for assignment, I can change apples to avocados. Is it with an E or is it, I don't know. I'm gonna put an E there. Be, being raised in the 80s and 90s with the Dan Quayle situation and the whole potatoes thing, I'm just gonna put an E there. Hopefully I'm right. If I run this and I go look at groceries now, It has changed this from apples to avocados. So if you ever have a list of items that you're keeping track of, and for whatever reason you need to change these, you can by just referring to their position and assigning a new number, excuse me, assigning a new value. You can also assign numbers to lists. So far we've just used strings, but we can also assign numbers. We could say, um, how about, uh, what's a good thing we could say here? Uh, people in class is, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just making stuff up at this point. And I could say there were, there are five people in this class that we're dealing with right now but maybe a later class will have 15. Another class may have two. Another class may have 10, six, and we'll say eight. People in classes Bear with me a second. The dogs are about to come stomping down the stairs. This is still a list. But the element at position zero is an integer. So even though people in classes is a list, this type of the element in there is an integer. We can also say people in classes. Let's say somebody were to start joining the class. They were in a meeting just now. 
and they decided they want to come into this class a little late, which is fine. We want to have as many people enjoying this as we can. I can say people in classes equals, and I'm looking at the first element, people in classes zero plus one. If I run that, so it started out as five people in the position zero. I took the number that was in there, I added one to it, and now there's six. What if somebody else comes in? I can run this again, and if I run that, now there are seven. So a list allows us to have multiple containers of things in them. And they don't have to all be the same. We could do a situation where it looks like, um, I don't know, what about sports and players? I could do something like football two, basketball, five, baseball, three, and it's still a list. Now, you'll notice that I'm hand typing all of these things. There is a nice little shortcut. When you start typing something here, see I have the word sports. If I hit the tab key, it will autocomplete to the best of its ability. And it doesn't matter what it is. If I have P here, and it will print out all of the options for me and I can go grab one that makes sense. I can grab people and classes and hit enter. But for this one, I'm gonna do sports and players hit tab to autocomplete. And I'm going to say at the position zero, the first item is going to be a string. It could also be that I look at number one, it's now an integer. So a list doesn't really care what's in it. It can be strings, it can be integers, it can be a mix, it can have be floats, it can be booleans. Imagine if you had like the it was football two and then the number of dollars it takes for you to play football. And that would be a float because it would be, I don't know, $38.50. You can do this with lists. So we now have lists. We've been doing things with single variables. So how do we do things to elements in a list? Well, we're going to use something called a loop. And what a loop does is it goes into something, takes something out of it, performs an action, goes to the next one, performs an action, goes to the next one, performs an action, and so on until it's told to stop. And the first kind of loop that we're going to work with is called a for loop. A for loop gets its name basically for like, uh, when you go to a party and you are buying something, a gift for somebody, there is, you are doing something. You are doing something for a person. If you were to have, say, let's say we were, had a, you were teaching a class and there were 30 people in the class. And it's just like that old thing that we heard in kindergarten. You know, remember when you were chewing gum and the, the teacher would say, hey, did you bring enough for everybody? And what if you did? What if you did, you were in a class of 30, and so you did make sure that you had at least 29 pieces of candy, and so you would walk through, and you would go to the first person, and you would hand them a piece of candy, and then you would go to the next person, and you would hand them a piece of candy, because you brought candy for everyone in the class. So if I go back over here to my groceries list, I am going to say for item in, groceries and hit a colon. It's very much like our if statement. I'm going to take the groceries list and for every single thing on my groceries list, 
I'm going to take it by itself, do the indented commands, and when they're done, start over again with the next one. So I'm going to say print, open parentheses. I'm going to print a string, and I'm going to say, um, I need to buy um, item. Now, if I run this right now, it just went into the groceries and it said for every single thing in the groceries list, I want you to just print this sentence. Well, it didn't do anything with the value item because right now item is just a string. Remember we put the curly braces around it and then we put the F in front here. If I rerun this, it has now gone into the groceries list, looked at the first item, that's the string avocados. It's going to put that avocados value into the item variable, and then it's going to run this statement here, this print command, using the word avocados as the value in the item variable. Once it's done, it goes back to the top again, and goes to the next thing in groceries, which happens to be bananas. And then the next thing, which is cheese. And the next thing is detergent. And the next thing is eggs. Now, we can use this for statement in conjunction with our if statements. So what if instead of this, I said if, um, well, let's do it this way. If I said this, I, I love to eat item, and I run this, well, I do love to eat avocados, and I love to eat bananas, and I love to eat cheese. I really don't like to eat detergent. Um, if I can av avoid it, I would much rather spend the rest of my days not eating detergent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check and see if item is detergent. If item, now the single equal sign is to say, take whatever comes after me and put me into this variable. But if I put the two there, the two equals, the double equal sign is we're going to check and see if this value is in there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write if item double equals detergent, I want to say print F, I do no one, how about this? No one should eat item. And then I'm going to put else here I'm going to hit I'm going to go in front of this print and I'm going to hit tab to indent it because Python looks for the indentations to see what happens inside of statements and loops so if I run this I am going through my list in a pro as a, using a process called iteration I am iterating through it I am going to the first one, then the second, then the third. I'm checking the contents of the variables, and then I am running a statement based upon what my conditional evaluation is of the contents of the item variable. And I'm able to change my sentences accordingly. If I want, let's say, I want to check for two things. I'm going to put this in parentheses and I'm going to use the pipe character, which is usually in the key just above the enter sign. And I'm going to put item double equals, um, no one should eat, let's put eggs for right now. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true, but 
this gives us an, a way to evaluate these conditions. This is a Boolean operator. This is the OR Boolean. So this is going to say, go into groceries, my groceries list, grab the first thing. Is the first thing detergent or is the first thing eggs? No, skip this line and go to the next one. Then we're gonna go back up to the top. We've looked at the first item in position zero. Now we're gonna look at the second item, that's bananas. Is, is bananas equal to detergent? No. Is bananas equal to eggs? No. Skip this line and go on down here. So this is a simple way to introduce logic into your programs when you have to be looking at a lot of stuff over and over and over again. So far we've done this with strings. We can do stuff with numbers as well. And because it's programming, we always like to find the easiest way to do stuff. So today we've talked about the type command and the print command from last week. I'm going to introduce something called the range command. Notice that as soon as I started typing, it was black, but as soon as I completed it with the word it knew, it turned light green. So we have a command, the range command, and I'm going to put the number 10 in here. Range 10, if I run this, it's going to give me a range of integers. It's going to assume I'm starting at zero, and I'm going to go all the way up to, but stop just before 10. Now it's not really showing anything here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the list command to convert it into a list. So just like before, as soon as I type the T, it becomes a command. Open parentheses, automatically puts its pair there. Range, open parentheses, 10, and then I'm gonna run this. So you'll notice it's a list because it's got the square brackets on either side and commas separating all of the elements in there. And just like before, remember the first element is zero and it goes all the way up to, but stops just before 10. Again, kind of weird. It's a weird holdover from some of the ways things were done in computer science and before. So I now have a list with range 10 and it's giving me all of these numbers. And this is where things, this is where programming really shines. Because if I ever have to type the numbers from one to say, I don't know, 50, it's a lot easier than typing them out each individually and hitting the commas. I can also specify a starting point by saying, I wanna go from five to say 15. and it starts at five, goes all the way up to, and stops just before 15. I can even put a third number in here, saying how many I want to skip before going to the next one. This will give me all of the odd numbers from five up to 15, but just before. So it doesn't include 14, because 14 is not odd, right? I've started at five, I'm adding two to five, that gives me seven. I add two to five, two, two to seven, that gives me nine. I add two to nine, I get 11 and so on. If I add two to 13, that gives me 15, but I need to stop before I get there and that's why I have these five numbers. So let me just put back in here. Like I said, I wanted to make sure that we have a bunch of stuff in here because I'm going to give you this sheet later for you to refer to. We have a range. We have a way to convert a range into a list. We've talked about for loops. Now what we're going to do is we're gonna take a for loop. We're going to have multiple conditionals and we're going to make statements based upon those conditionals. So I'm gonna start with for. Now, a lot of times when you're reading notation online, it's very common for the variable that they use here is just the letter I. It's a very common thing used in uh, math. Sometimes they use I, 
Then if they've already used I, then they'll use J. Again, programmers are, tend to be lazy and they go for the easy way out. You could type whatever you wanted to here. This is all about what's comfortable for you. I'm going to use I just because I too am lazy. I'm gonna say for I in range 10, print I. Now, since I'm using a variable here, I don't have to put it in quotes. It's not necessarily a string, and I'm going to run it. So what it did, just like up here with our grocery list, it went into the range, it grabbed out an I, it printed it, there wasn't anything else more to do, it went back up and then went to the next one. Now, I'm going to be a little bit more complicated for I in range, 10, we're going to do multiple conditionals here. If i double equals zero, we're going to evaluate i to see if it is in fact, um, contains the numeral zero. Print, um, I would sure like a cat. Now, at this point, I could do an else. And if I run this, it does it 10 times. It checks to see if it's equal to zero and runs that first one. After that, I is never equal to zero, so it runs the else statement nine times. So if we have multiple conditions we wanna check, we can do something called an else if, and that looks like this. Now I can make a second condition to check. If I equals one, print I have one cat, but I'd like some more. If I run this, it checks the first condition, prints a statement. It goes back to the top. It gets the next value out of our range. It goes through, since I is equal to one, that first condition doesn't evaluate, and we go to the second one. It evaluates here, it prints that statement, then it goes back up and gets a two and runs through it again. Now we're gonna say another else if I is less than, I don't know, let's say five. Print, open parentheses, open quotes. I'm going to say curly braces I, cats, is the perfect number of cats. Remember to put the F here, and as soon as I do, it converts this to black, showing that it's going to evaluate the variable. And when I run that, it now changes our sentence based upon the value contained in I as we're pulling it out of the range. I can go down here and I'm gonna say after it, print, that is all I need to say about cat ownership. This last line, since it's not indented, this for loop is gonna run through zero all the way up to nine, and then it's going to stop here, and then it will run this last line once. So at this point, we have done, we've dealt with lists, we've dealt with uh, lists of strings, we've dealt with lists of integers, we've created a list of integers using a range, we have used 
the lists with the for loop to go into our list, pull things out in order, check them for some sort of criteria, and keep on going. We evaluate the criteria, we perform some sort of action based upon that, and then we, uh, we, we evaluate based upon the criteria and we perform some sort of action based upon it then. At this point, we can do all sorts of wonderful things with loops. So the exercise at this point, I know a lot of people see this and they think, that's really great, Brown. I love having the opportunity to talk about the number of cats in my house, but this doesn't really make sense for what I would do at work. So imagine instead what you've been given is say, for example, a list of maybe 200,000, I don't know, it's a text file with 200,000 maybe book titles. And the first part is the book title, and then there's a comma, and the next is the number of copies that we have in the library. From there, what we do is we would go through line by line and treat it just like a list. We could go through it and we could look at these things and we could read the first line. And let's say the, uh, it's um, the Velveteen Rabbit and we have zero copies. And we would say, for I in this list of books, take the first title and check the number that's immediately next to it. Is that number greater than three? If it is, we don't want to buy anymore. And so then we go back to the next one. We go back to the top of the loop and we go to the next one in the sheet. And maybe the next one is, I don't know, um, uh, Wuthering Heights. And then we only have two copies of that. And we want to meet this threshold of three. And so then we can print a report of all of the things in this text file that are we have fewer than three copies of. Perhaps we would do it such that it would be automatic and it would generate um, a, it would, instead of generating a report, what if we had a publisher and we had a book title, a book quantity, and a book publisher. And in a separate file, we had a book publisher, maybe a bunch of documents there for the book publishers. And so each line, we would look at the book title, we'd look at the quantity, and we'd look at the book publisher. And we would go through and we would evaluate the number. And if the number did not meet the threshold that we wanted, we would say, take that title and put it into publisher A's text file. And uh, the next one we would see, it would have a different publisher. So we would create a new text file. And then all of a sudden, you've evaluated 200,000 books based upon a criteria, and then you have created multiple text files, one for each of the different uh, publishers that you could then say, I want these 4,000 titles because we're missing that many. And so, yes, we've done some very simple examples here about cats and grocery lists and stuff like that, but there's anywhere that you can put um, information into text, Anywhere that you can put it such that each line um, on a text file and then you hit enter and you have another line on a text file, you can treat that like a list. And once that's a list, you can start doing these things with various loops and data types. Do we have any questions at this point? I didn't see anything coming up in the chat. I hope everybody can hear me. Okay, I see a note from Darren Lee. So what I'd like to do at this point is I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here.